Welcome. My name is Andrew. I, I'm an engineer at Intel. I've been working on uh, WebAssembly and uh, WASI for some time now, optimizing several runtimes, worked on some of the specifications. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Tamayo Rios. I am a staff software engineer on Octo. At Fastly, Octo is Office of the CTO. Okay. Uh, so uh, to kick things off a little bit, I was, uh, I saw, came across this slide recently, um, uh, and the, the, its original sort of purpose is like, hey, we have a hard time telling how hard things are. And this is actually from 2014, and at that point in time, people used to think checking whether a photo of a, of a bird uh, is going to take a research team in five years. But to, today, uh, we're going to see it done, and it actually took about 10 years to actually make this a reality, to be able to do it in a few seconds. In, in, uh, in WASM, but we're actually going to see how AI is going to make everything we care about better. Um, and so that, uh, what you actually have there is a piece of generated AI. We'll actually show it live um, uh, running in uh, uh, WASM time. So uh, the prompt was AI will save the world fire robot, uh, and it gave some, <laughs> some interesting uh, imagery. Uh, and, and so what the, the reason why we really care about uh, uh, generative AIs, because it has the, the potential to transform almost every aspect of, of knowledge work, whether it's like text generation, so think about like legal contracts, um, uh, like auditing business summaries, um, like, like the, what, what uh, some companies were trying to do before, which is like provide an automatic summarization of like a business report to an executive. That's now actually in the realm of possibility. Um, obviously, with the, as you saw uh, in the previous session, there is a little bit of hallucination that can sometimes go on, so there's still some work to do. Uh, but there's already a ton of acceleration in the code space uh, where, like, if you've used uh, Copilot or other similar tools, um, you can uh, dramatically increase the productivity of yourself as a, as a developer. Um, there's a lot of generative AI and, and images, um, uh, and the, also uh, there's starting to be a lot of stuff in video. There was recently a paper that just came out that uh, actually showed uh, uh, some of the first like realistic 3D models. Um, I think about for like game design, we have to create character models. That the fir the first example of, of being able to do that with generative AI, which is just really incredible. So I'm super excited about it because it's gonna it's really going to transform and impact everything. Um, and uh, obviously, there's some hype that we have to work through, uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll get there. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to explain, since this is a WebAssembly conference, we're going to talk about how we can use uh, machine learning inside WebAssembly. And it's going to you know, sort of dovetail into the previous talk, if you were here, where we're going to use WASINN, the specification. So we'll explain a little bit about WASINN. Um, and then we're going to try to describe, if, if you were to build your own uh, product that combine a, a function as a service service with machine learning, how would you do it? And so we'll sort of describe that. And we'll describe the two key... Um, changes that we that we decided to make uh, in order to make this possible. So named models and process isolation is what we're going to use for performance and security. Um, and we'll, we'll show you a demo of all this working, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at, at the end. Um, so well, why do we need WASI and N? I, I hope you're familiar with WASI as a system interface for WebAssembly modules. Um, and the key really piece here is performance. Um, so Mingxu and I, Mingxu, can you say hi? Um, several years ago, maybe three years ago, we gave a talk at, at a CNCF WASM day where we showed that uh, without something like WASDNN, you can lose orders of magnitude of performance when performing um, machine learning inference. But when you do have a way to get, get outside of the WebAssembly sandbox, you can get that performance back. Um, why is that the case? Well, because... There's special hardware needed for performing machine learning inference quickly. And so some of the things are, you know, there's full width SIMD on, on different architectures. On certain architectures, there's, you know, machine learning specific features like AMX or VNNI on x86. Um, and, and of course, there's all types of new hardware that you might want to use for running machine learning models, like GPUs and TPUs, NPUs, you know, whatever comes next. And, and, and not all of that will be available to you within uh, WebAssembly. 
Uh, some, some of the, you know, WebAssembly needs to take into account all the different architectures and it can't make special instructions. And so that's why something like WASNN exists. Uh, it also exists to scale with the ecosystem, which right now is moving quite quickly. There's new models being developed all the time. There's new operators being developed within the model. There's new tensor types. There's new model encodings. And, and if we tied ourselves too closely to a specific model or framework, um, we, we wouldn't be able to keep up with how fast the ecosystem moves. And so that's why WASNN exists. It's an inference API for WebAssembly that uses machine learning capabilities of your, of your native system for any machine learning framework, not just a specific one. OK, um, let me give you a sort of a brief history lesson of uh, WASNN was uh, proposed, Ming Shu and I uh, sort of kicked it off in 2020 with a, with a proposal. And since then, we've had several presentations uh, on this. I, I showed you a slide from WASM Day in 2021. And Radu has uh, talked about it in, in 2022. More recently, we've you know, talked and, and proposed the name model extension with, with several of the different implementers. And here's sort of when support appeared in the different implementations of standalone uh, WebAssembly runtimes. So in WASM time, there's support in 2021 or 2020. Uh, and WASM Edge and Whammer soon followed. Um, what does it look like? Well, look at this pseudo REST. You need to load a model uh, from some bytes. Uh, you need to set up an execution context, and then you compute inference. Uh, this is all these yellow sort of calls here, what you need to do to use WASNN. And right now, it's all defined in WIDEX, which is the uh, uh, interface uh, language for the old version of WASI. Um, it's a very high-level API. It covers 80% of the use cases, but you can't fine-tune any of the you know, knobs that, that uh, you might with like a, a more low-level API. And it's made up of various parts. So there's a specification of WASNN, there's bindings to various languages, and then there's implementations in the engines like WASMTime or, or Whammer. Um, but that has changed with uh, recent work we've done to the spec which uh, that's the link there if you want to contribute. Now uh, the specification is defined in WIT, the new language for WASI. Um, and we're trying to make it simpler. So we have some issues out there to boil this down um, by using name models and, and just you know, a single call. It should be a little bit simpler to use in the future. Matthew, cool. you're up. Thank you. So, um, as we started thinking about how do you build this function as a service, um, what are the key components and sort of you need in that recipe? Uh, uh, there's a couple of uh, broad areas that came up. So like deployment, user experience, uh, performance, and security. Uh, I think um, we basically went through these and, uh, and the solutions that we came up with are sort of aligned at, at tackling really the two big ones are performance and security. Because uh, those are the ones that uh, um, I, I, performance in particular was addressed at the spec level. And then security, we had to make some design choices in WASM time as we did this implementation to really, uh, uh, to, to really make sure that like, we're not just protecting uh, the infrastructure, we're also protecting uh, other tenants from models. So uh, one of the things that uh, is not covered enough is uh, a lot of these machine learning frameworks are just just like gigantic RCE <laughs> packages. Like uh, PyTorch still has open bugs where it's like, oh, we, un we can unpickle files and like take over your entire machine so you shouldn't load any untrusted models. And so that becomes very challenging when you're trying to build a scalable uh, framework where you want people to be able to bring their own models and be able to run them at the edge. Um, so uh, compute what at edge, what is it? It's a, uh, uh, it's, makes it easy to secure, uh, securely deploy, run, uh, and scale globally distributed WebAssembly modules. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a serviceless request-based architecture, uh, and it runs uh, basically really close to the user so you can get low latency. Um, this can sometimes not be as important if like, you're running a model that takes a really long time to run. 
Uh, but if you're doing a lot of like uh, lower latency use cases like image classifications, those models can complete in like 100 milliseconds or even sometimes faster. Uh, and then if you do like heavy quantization and a bunch of other things, you can get it to like nine milliseconds even for some of like the text uh, and LLM use cases. Um, so uh, how hard is it to support for WASI and N? Well, it took a little bit of work, so we're gonna dive into that. Um, so these are some of the, the things uh, we encountered when trying to uh, uh, get this working. Um, so uh, the, the WASM time event loop um, can be sensitive to expensive guest processes. So say like if you run a, an inference request that takes like five seconds and you have a lot of, a lot of requests being handled by uh, WASM time, there can be issues. Uh, models can exceed compute memory and module size limits. So Computed Edge, for example, I believe has a 128 megabyte uh, WASM module uh, limit. Uh, and um, like some of the models are like eight gigs. So like how do you like load and sometimes bigger, like if you, as you probably heard earlier, like Llama 2 and some of those can be like hundreds of gigs and some, some are like terabytes in size. How do you actually load those and run those at the edge? Uh, Tuning for machine learning workloads is going to be different than traditional edge compute. So, like, when you're running a machine learning workload and you're having a bunch of requests coming in, like your CPU usage and your and like your GPU or TPU usage is going to be very different than just like regular edge compute workloads. Um, there's also limited sandboxing um, when directly linking framework libraries and process. So as you saw earlier in the slides, it was like load these bytes, pass them through to the host, and then the host passes them into some other library. Um, and what it's actually doing underneath the covers, it's actually compiling that model into like an execution graph that gets loaded onto either the hardware or the CPU. And it's literally passing XML encoded as bytes. And so, uh, I mean, not all of them are XML, but it's the XML-like things that, are, again, are not exactly the safest things to do when you're running directly in process. Um, and then the stateless server model means each request has to like reload the model. So a request comes in and you have to go and fetch those exact same bytes again, every time, over and over again, recompile it, because uh, there's just no way for caching with it within the current spec. So what this all boils down to is we need to decouple the model lifecycle from the fast request handling. So we have to split them apart so that um, we can manage the, how the lifecycle, like how long the model lives in memory, where, it's, where the execution actually happens um, and do it in the best place for each particular model and each particular uh, request. So let's dive into how we did that, how we changed the spec uh, to solve that problem. How do we de decouple the models from um, the actual fast request handling? Uh, so how it currently works with the old version of the spec is you'd have to do this. Uh, you'd have to fetch all the bytes of the model, which as you know, could be quite large, uh, somehow from a cache, from over HTTP, I don't know. And you'd have to pass those bytes into the load call, and that might do some work, like compile the model for your CPU or GPU or whatever. And then you'd finally get to do your, uh, your compute command. And if you had to do this each time that an HTTP request came into your functions as a service you know, machine, it's just too high of a cost. Um, and, and it's too hard of a cost, especially to pay for every single request. It's just going to take too long. So here's the change. Um, instead, before instantiation, before that WebAssembly module starts running, uh, the, the, web, uh, the machine learning model gets loaded and configured, and it gets given a name. Let's call it foo here. And so that way, when the HTTP request comes in, you load the model by name. It's already present in the host. And now you can both load it and compute your inference uh, quick enough uh, you know, for, to, to satisfy these requests, you know, not overload your server. Uh, so that was, the, that was one big change we made to the specification, named models. Uh, the second big sort of decision that we need to make is how to limit the blast radius from malicious models. Uh, with certain model frameworks, um, you can have operators that do all types of crazy things to your system, like open files or an open, do network I.O. You don't probably want to let that happen in your fast environment. And so we looked at two different ways of protecting the environment from a malicious model. The first was this hardware-based uh, thing 
where uh, there's a x86 feature called MPK, memory protection keys. It gives you 16 keys to mark pages of memory uh, as like protected with that key. And so uh, the, the idea would be, well, let's protect all the pages of the, of the like runtime from the pages that, that the model needs. Um, and there's some downsides. It only protects the CPU you know, memory pages. So if you want to run on a GPU, we can't use this feature. So we start looking at another option, which is the process-based isolation. And so if we you know, move this machine learning back end into a separate process, well, we can reuse all the OS-provided primitives for you know, process isolation. Uh, and you know, I, I guess you can talk more about the GPU drivers, but you know, they 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 already understand that um, uh, GPU calls from different processes should ha have a boundary between them. So it, it sort of solved the GPU problem. And but the downside here is there is a little bit of overhead to com communicate between processes. Yeah. But go ahead. I'll say something real quick here. Uh, so one, the memory protection keys are also uh, specific within a single process, so it's when you want to run multiple threads within a single process, you can actually isolate a thread from accessing other threads' memory. And then the other thing on the process base for the GPU drivers, uh, uh, part of this is built into, uh, like it's usually built into the GPU driver when uh, they're copying memory to and from the machine. They actually build stuff, so like, hey, you can't go grab some other process's memory. Because uh, that was actually one of our concerns originally, because uh, if you have a DMA-enabled PCIe device, you could you can just go start grabbing stuff from memory. Um, but most uh, GPU drivers do same things, like hey, you w they generate like a host pointer for you, such that a GPU thread can't go and just grab random memory. Um, and so th that is another reason why we're like, okay, if we do the 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 process boundary, it matches all up with what A, other things are doing. So for example, there's this thing called WGPU. It also has process boundaries, the isolation it lines up with what the drivers are doing, um, which uh, basically makes, makes us aligned with what the broader overall ecosystem is doing in that space. Go ahead, man. And uh, so this is gonna give you a quick overview of, of what we're gonna show you today and, and how it's all sort of glues together. Uh, so one of the big key pieces is we want to allow models to run where it makes the most sense. Uh, and this can mean uh, if you have a small model that's only going to use CPU, you can execute it locally. D uh, don't pay for an expensive network call to move it off to another box. Um, just run it locally and, and, and return it quickly. If you have a larger model, you know, so say like one of these like 400 gigabyte <laughs> like l large language models, uh, the tensor for that is tiny, and the tensors that come back are tiny. Maybe you want to have a special box dedicated to that somewhere else where you can ship that tensor over to that box to get the results. You, another thing you can do is you can manage the life cycles of models outside of walls in time with this approach. So um, what, what that means is we can now, uh, that we can control the caching behavior. So, right, so ca uh, Fastly, uh, one of the, the, the best features is that we have both a storage and caching layer um, that uh, basically globally distributed and just works. Uh, and we can actually tie into the, like how, like where the models are stored and how long they live in memory to optimize that automatically for, for customers. Uh, and then the async host APIs uh, uh, is actually another backend change. So this was a, a change to the, not the spec, but the actual host APIs inside of Wasm time uh, to make them async so that you can actually continue handling requests um, without issues. Uh, so as incoming requests are coming in, even if you're off doing inference in another box for 20 seconds. Um, and then the out of process model owning means way easier to like sandbox. So like if you go and you basically uh, run this in another box, then you can focus on sandboxing that process there uh, instead of trying to like introduce additional machinery uh, on your like Wasm host uh, to try to protect it uh, and isolate stuff running in there. Um, and so, specific, oh. wait one second. So one thing uh, I kind of skipped over this a little bit was the KServe backend. So KServe is a Kubernetes protocol. Um, it's already an uh, standard. And so what we actually are contributing to Wasm time is actually a KServe backend, which means that any ser inference server that speaks KServe uh, you'll now be able to invoke from Wasm time to be able to go 
make these, beha these calls and behavior. So uh, I think it's going to be super useful if, if for, for folks that are trying to run this um, to be able to use that. that. And right now it's HTTP because, um, long story, gRPC is not in WASM time yet, but if that ever lands, we'll, we'll look at implementing it. But, so right now we implement the HTTP protocol. All right, okay. demo. Now it's time for the demo. Okay. Um, we'll switch over here. We'll do a whole new tab. Okay. Is your server running? Live demo. Yeah. Am I? Yeah, I'm online. I sent you the video in case it doesn't run. Okay. Should we? Out. All right. Of course. I don't think like we the literally site can... we, we literally tested it. Yeah. Like right before we're like, oh this is gonna Good be Good thing we made the video though. We'll give it one more shot. Do you wanna yeah, give me one second? Give it a shot. Oh, again? Okay. Uh. We want to do a live. Huh. Okay. So video? Actually, no. Uh, do you want to switch? It's. I think it might be your internet. Really? Yeah, because my it, I just tested it and I have internet. Okay. Go for it. All right. Sorry, I'm just trying to. All right. Hopefully, my. All right. Hopefully, it doesn't do the split screen, but I guess I can just try. Yes. Okay. So, I'm going to do a, a real quick. Uh, we're going to start off with a classification demo. So this is sort of your uh, classical example of a smaller model. Um, this is actually using the OpenVINO backend because um, uh, one of the tests inside of WASINN is actually using um, actually uses MobileNet v2, uh, which is a very small intended for mobile devices and classification. So very small, very fast. Um, I'm just going to try uh, killer whale picture, and so I'm just going to hit upload file. Um, 96% probability identification that's a killer whale. Um, uh, the, what's actually sort of what's happening here is, uh, this is this image is actually uploaded to a computed edge, uh, basically, uh, worker. And that worker actually takes that image, does the extraction into a tensor, calls the WASINN code, gets back like a 1,000 element vector of probabilities, sorts them, reattaches the labels, and then returns like the top n that's specified there. So all of that is programmatic um, in WebAssembly. In, in WebAssembly, um, and then uh, we're going to do. You know, it auto completed the prompt I've been using. So uh, I'm going to do a prompt of heroic kittens in the style of Naruto. Uh, this is going to take about five, six seconds. Uh, to execute, and so what this is actually doing, <laughs> so this is stable diffusion, so uh, it's a standard model. Um, it's stable diffusion uh, uh, 1.0. Um, uh, this is, at, we, it actually takes this prompt, and it's basically sending it, converting the prompt to a byte tensor, and then sending that over, it goes through KServe, uh, and it is basically PyTorch and ONNX. It's like three different models that it actually glues together on the back end. Um, but now with that, that case serve backend, it's actually possible to do more complicated stuff like stable diffusion, which has a scheduler and all this other stuff that has to work to happen. And so um, if anybody has uh, any like interesting prompts they want to try, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a demo. And so this, uh, uh, this basically is working right now. And so uh, I guess... Oh, you have the next slide. So next slide's gonna be Q and A. I'll switch. Switch again. Switch again. <laughs> um, but if anybody wants to try more, I'm happy to stick around. If you guys want to try more prompts. Uh,
This is going to be a really exciting slide. That's very exciting. <laughs> the end. <All> right. <laughs> if, you want, if, if you want to try this out on Computed Edge, uh, please drop me an email. Um, we are looking for folks to help us test this out and improve it as we're, as we're building out this, this functionality. Um, and then uh, if you have any, if you're interested in participating and working on the spec, uh, it, uh, you can contact Andrew uh, or you can even just go and open issues at, on the GitHub uh, site. Uh, and it's not posted on here yet, but we'll actually be posting the source code for the computed edge portion of this as well. Um, uh, since we got, th thanks to uh, Tyler who said, hey, I can open source the, the demo, so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any questions on anything we've covered so far? All right. Well, thank you again for coming, and we'll be available to talk afterwards if you want to run some more prompts or look through any of the details.